Welcome to the Bruce Williams channel. Welcome to today's ramble. I know some of you are aware that I bought a Vacheron Constantin 4500V stainless steel in blue before it got totally hyped a couple years ago. I really enjoyed that watch. I wore the heck out of it. And then after about a year, I mercilessly flipped it and I moved on with my watch journey to other watches. And I know some of you, you, you still don't understand why I flipped the overseas because I hear you commenting even, you know, last week about <laughs> that move on some of my videos. So in this video, I'm going to talk about rebuying the overseas. This question comes from Daryl who reaches out and says, Hey Bruce, if you had the chance, would you repurchase the 4500V or were there things you didn't like about it or that put you off from getting it again? And secondly, now that you've experienced both, do you really value high horology and is the price justified? Or is high quality mass produced products such as Rolex and some other brands sufficient? And I think this is a great question. So let's ramble about this today. And Daryl, instead of typing out a response to you, I am going to do a video response for you. I hope you appreciate it. Now, would I buy the overseas again? The uh, short answer is no, I wouldn't. And it's not necessarily a knock against the watch because the watch is absolutely beautiful. You notice the finish work. The design is just marvelous. I love the movement. I love the dial. I love the presence. I love everything about the watch. Um, say for one thing, I'll get to that here in a minute, but if I'm going back to, uh, <laughs> to Vacheron Constantin, I'm going with a different watch. I'd like some complications. So perhaps the dual time or perhaps the chronograph just to mix it up a little bit, or, Hey, do I even need an overseas? I've had that experience. I've enjoyed that experience, but another one that really has my attention and has had my attention for a couple years is the American 1921 in 40 millimeters of pink gold with the off axis dial. I think that watch is beautiful. It's so cool. It's very unique. And that might be, you know, where I want to go if I go back into Vacheron Constantin. I can tell you a couple things about myself. One, I don't have a plan. I have long term watch goals, but I never know where I'm, you know, really going next. It's whatever I feel like. And I have weird taste. So I've taken a very meandering path through my watch journey and I always have an open mind. So next month, am I going back into Vacheron Constantin? Possibly. Or am I delving further into Grand Seiko? Or am I finally getting into vintage watches? Or am I going to go into high-end independence? Or, you know, whatever the case may be. Am I going to become a Cartier collector? I never know. And that's kind of the fun of it for me. It's just taking the hobby one step at a time and going wherever I feel like, wherever the river meanders, if that makes sense. Now, is there anything that I didn't like about the overseas. I would say there's one thing that I think should be improved, but it's personal preference and you may disagree with me. But as far as the fit, the finish, the movement, even the, you know, the non-hacking balance, uh, that does not bother me. I love the different straps included. The only thing that I would change is the anti-reflective treatment is very lacking on this watch. In fact, I don't even know if it's present on the Sapphire Crystal. And when you have a blue dial that is that beautiful and deep and brilliant, you want to view it to the highest degree of clarity possible. So I think that's the only thing that's really holding it back from an enjoyment perspective. That being said, is it a deal breaker? Absolutely not. Can you live with a watch with a little bit of reflections and visual interest on the crystal? Absolutely. Now to the second part of your question, Daryl, um, now that I've experienced owning a high horology piece from a Holy Trinity brand, is the price justified or, uh, you know, are you, are you safe? Are you sufficient using brands that are just mass produced, but still luxury like Rolex, like Omega, like Breitling, like Cartier, or like other brands in that segment? Uh, here's the thing. I think this is better illustrated talking about the difference between a $500 watch and a $5,000 watch. I think most of us that uh, are here in this video at this point, we've experienced both of those price segments. 
And if you recall going into a $5,000 watch for the first time, especially if you really jumped from 500 to 5,000 and you didn't play with that, you know, thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar price segment, you notice a massive difference in terms of the finish, in terms of the detail, in terms of the dial execution, and certainly in the movement. And that difference is pretty drastic. It's very noticeable. And it's a very fun thing to go into luxury for the first time. I know a lot of us probably can recall the exact watch where we had that experience. Now, let me equate that from going, say, from a $5,000, $10,000, maybe even a $15,000 mass-produced watch, a luxury watch, and then getting a Holy Trinity brand or a high-end independent. You're getting into high horology. And yes, there is a difference, but it's not as pronounced, in my opinion, as going from, say, a $500 watch to a $5,000 watch. And those differences, they're very satisfying. So yes, it's not just price, it's not just complication or precious metal, it's how it's executed. And part of it is, uh, you know, there's something about knowing that the watch you buy, it's a bespoke product, it's hand produced, it's not done in high numbers, and it's meant to be enjoyed by the very few. Contrasting that with an awesome brand, say Rolex or a Speedmaster from Omega that are just pumped out down the production line, uh, mostly by robots. Yeah, it's still a heck of a watch. And I love those watches, but it's a different feel. And so where do you value those differences? Because there will be differences. Uh, they're just not as dramatic as say going from 5,000 uh, down to uh, 500. I mean, that's a big jump. 5,000 on up to 25,000. There's still a jump, but it's not as it's not as drastic as one might imagine. Uh, just looking at the dollars. So, going back to the question, is the price justified? I would say for myself, yeah, the price is justified. I love high horology products. There is something very exciting about a Patek Philippe, a Vacheron Constantin a high-end independent, something very limited, something very cool and very unique. Yeah, I do think the price is justified, but you might disagree. And then the next watch enthusiast down the line, they might have a different opinion on that as well. So you have to figure that answer for yourself. And I would encourage you, Daryl, uh, you know, go try on various brands that authorize dealers and look at the differences between a Rolex or a Vacheron Constantin and, and do you like those differences? Because you may or you may not. And I'm not going to judge you either way because I think, you know, enjoying this hobby to the fullest, it's about finding our comfort zone, what we really appreciate, and then just, you know, rolling with the punches and enjoying the watches that speak to you the most, whether they're affordable or mid-level or high-end or high horology. I think there's fun to be had at all price segments. There are differences, but again, where do you value those small differences? I think it's going to be a different answer for everyone. So hopefully, Daryl, you felt like I've answered that question. I hope those of you that are still here listening to this video, I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Hope you have a great day. I'll see you next time.